So we are at point B of unit four of the gospel is the power. Unit four is power against the powers. And point B is the background of the powers. So we're going to pick up. We we learned previously about Satan being cast down to the earth and how the earth is without form and void and the waters are covering the surface of the earth, the waters of chaos and and wastewater and filth and and just disorder. And that's where we left off. So we're going to pick up and God is going to begin to create order out of chaos. So that's exactly what he does. And you know this from Genesis 1 and 2, if you're a Bible student, or and if you're not, you can hit pause and just go read Genesis 1 and 2 about how God created order out of chaos. On the first day, he said, let there be light. And he separated light from darkness. On the second day, he separated the waters beneath from the waters above. So now you have the the waters, still the wastewaters that are beneath, and you have the waters that are in the sky above in the heavens. On the day three, he created dry ground and put all of the waters, he separated them, put a boundary that they couldn't cross unless he allowed them to. Um, and now there's dry ground and the dry ground brought forth life and vegetation. Hallelujah. But on the fourth day, God begins to populate what he has already created. And as he populates it, he, he also gives authority over to other rulers. So God is still sovereign. He maintains all sovereign authority over all of creation, but he appoints deputies to rule under his authority. So this starts with uh, day four, and we're going to pick up at Genesis chapter one, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night, and he made the stars." And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and morning the fourth day. So did you see it? God gave power. God gave authority. He created the sun and the moon and the stars, He, he and he, he gave them authority to rule over the day to rule over the night and to govern the times and the seasons and the days and the years. And this becomes more important as Israel gets their uh, divine calendar of the feasts of God. But it's also um, kind of a jab at some of the other uh, societies that were there. You know, many of the ancient civilizations, they worship the sun, they worship the moon, they worship the stars. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But in this passage of the creation account from the Bible, God doesn't even yet give the sun and the moon a name. They're just the big light and the smaller light. But they have been given authority from God to govern, to rule. And you can see also from Psalm 136, uh, and this is verse 9, the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. That word for rule means rule, have dominion over, to reign, to give order. Okay, so this was the job of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Then God moves on. Day five, he creates the fish to fill the waters, and he creates the birds to fill the waters that are above in the skies. And day six, he moves on. God creates the beasts, and he creates the humans. Once he creates the humans, he does another deputizing of his authority. So we're going to pick up at Genesis chapter one still, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. There there's so much in these passages, but we're trying to stay focused on the power and the uh, of the you know the power of the gospel against the powers. So we're talking about man, the creation of man. Let them have dominion 
over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God creates man and gives him authority, deputizes his authority to man. He says, let them have dominion. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So mankind is male and female. Man cannot reproduce on his own. Now, Adam's name is mankind. Adam in Hebrew means mankind. Eve in Hebrew means life, you know, living one. So male and female, this he created them in his image together, you know, two, two of the same kind. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over it, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So you see, like, yes, we just kind of repeated ourselves. God said one thing, and then God did the same thing. And you're wondering, why is the Bible saying the same thing twice? Why? Because God wants you to get the point. God created man, and he gave them authority over all that God had created. He, mankind was the pinnacle of God's work. You know, it's, it's the, the climax of God's work. Mankind is going to get authority to rule with God. Under God's sovereign authority, man is deputized to rule over all things that God created. It's the coolest thing ever. It's really too bad that Adam and Eve messed it up so badly. But have dominion. What that word means is rule over it, dominate it, tread it down, rule it, subjugate it, take possession of it, to subdue. That's also, you know, a word in here, fill the earth and subdue it means subject it, put it under your power for like use force to keep it under control, bring it into bondage to you, make it subservient to you. And my favorite is the last definition of it is tread it down with the feet. Why is that my favorite? Because what did Jesus come to do? He crushed the head of the serpent with his foot. He trampled on the serpent. Hallelujah. Well, Adam and Eve were supposed to do that from the garden. So we know that the evil one has already been cast down to the earth. God, because God can no longer give access to the evil one to him because the evil one's been cast out of the heavenly realm, God creates a lesser being to have authority over the one who's in rebellion against him. And so mankind's job was not just to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and enjoy everything that God had created for them to enjoy, but also anything on earth or in all of creation that was in rebellion against God, Adam and Eve, their job was to bring it into subjection, not just to themselves, to exalt themselves over it, but in subjection to God, because they were God's deputies. That's what mankind was designed by God to do. One human family ruling the world together with God in love and unity with one another, subjugating all of the powers of the evil one under their authority, their God-given authority. That was God's original design. So after the world was created, the serpent, Satan, who's already there because he's been cast out of heaven, entices mankind out of obedience, out of the, the beautiful design that God had designed them with, into rebellion against God. And if you know your Bible, you know the story. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We're going to jump right into Genesis 3, verse 13. And for you real geeks out there, it's verse 13b, because we're jumping in halfway through the verse. The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So she knows She knows that the serpent deceived her. And that word for deceived, if you dig into the root word, it has an equivalent. And that equivalent word means to be put into debt or put under usury. So usury is against the law. It's charging exorbitant interest rates that that make the debt completely unpayable, right? The serpent put 
Eve in debt. The serpent deceived her, and she disobeyed God and ate from the tree that God had told her and Adam. Actually, God had told Adam not to eat from. That was the the, the command God gave to Adam. All of these trees you can eat, that tree don't eat. But the woman, and Adam was standing right there, the serpent deceived her. She ate, passed it over to Adam. He took a bite, and we know the rest of the story. So the very powers that mankind was supposed to subdue and tread upon and crush with their feet and conquer and destroy all rebellion against God. Instead, they caved. They bowed their knee. You know, they're supposed to tread it with their foot. Instead, they bow their knee and they submitted themselves to the powers that they were supposed to subject to them. So they submitted themselves to them and to the serpent and obeyed him. So as a result of this deception, the serpent was cursed to crawl on its belly. Now, why does this become super fun? Because we just learned that the serpent used to have six wings. What? So now the serpent, the seraphim, is now no more wings on your belly you shall go. Do you see this? Like, this is why it's a super curse. It's like, yep, you get to eat dust. You used to be able to fly and have the fresh air, but now no more fresh air for you. You're going to eat dirt. Okay, so God says, Genesis 3, 14, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. So that is the curse that is put upon the serpent because the serpent deceived Adam and Eve into rebellion, his own rebellion. Since he was originally rebellious, you know, he deceived Adam and Eve into the same pattern of rebellion through self-exaltation against God and against God's command. So here we go. Through the the, the next couple of points um, and in this unit, we're going to understand more about how these powers and when these powers began to have power over us or power over mankind. So from this point forward... There are clear distinctions between male and female. Now, yes, there are. There had always been clear distinctions between male and female. God made man out of the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life into him. The woman was not made that way. The woman was made out of the rib of man. So we know that there were always distinctions between male and female. I know there's a lot of confusion about that in some cultures today. God is not confused. There were always distinctions between male and female. I'll just stop there. Okay, so keeping on going. But from this point forward, even though they had always been male and female, now their very existence is altered based on whether they are male or female. So the man, his existence is going to become one of sweat and toil among thorns and thistles. By the sweat of his brow, he will eat. He's now got to provide for himself. And if he's a nice guy, he'll provide for the woman too. But that's a whole different story. We'll get into that in a bit of how violence and chaos starts to take over. But man, instead of the ground just abundantly producing everything that's needed, so all you have to do is walk up to a tree and, you know, everything you want is right there for you because God is awesome and he created creation that way. Now, bread is going to be eaten and produced by the sweat of your brow and the ground is going to produce thorns and thistles and other unpleasant things like weeds. If you're a gardener or you have a garden, you know, weeds are just evil. And so, you know, it's he, he this is going to be man's existence now that the the curse is upon the the ground because of what he has done the rebellion that he's had against god the woman she's going to experience pain in raising her children. And this isn't just about childbirth. We don't have time to get into that whole thing right now, but it's not just about childbirth. It's that raising children will be a painful process. Why? Because sin is now in the world. You know, for a mother to watch their their two-year-old child who doesn't need to be taught how to tell a lie come up to them and tell a lie, it's heartbreaking the first time that it happens. But no child 
child needs to be told how to lie. Sin is in them. And so women will experience the pain of watching their children have sin that needs to be trained out of them or just it's it's there. You know, so a woman, all women, whether they're trying to train the evil out of their child or not, are going to experience pain in raising their children. The woman's desire will also be to rule her husband. That word is like a beast to devour, you know, like, whew, you know, so her desire is going to be to devour her husband, to rule over her husband, but her husband will actually rule over her. So you just see that there, from this point forward in mankind who were created to be two that are one, two that are one, working together, working with one purpose, working under God's authority with delegated authority from God. Now they have different pains, different problems, you know, because there are distinctions between the curse that God put um, in their lives. And in God, I want to be careful with my language because God never actually cursed man and God never actually cursed woman. But because of their choices, there were curses that will make their life unpleasant in other ways. So also from this point forward, mankind is subject to the serpent. We talked about this. You're a slave to whatever you obey. So they obeyed the serpent, and now they themselves are subjected under a power that is lesser than God. So the serpent succeeded in usurping not usurpenting, but usurping mankind's God-delegated authority to rule the world because mankind put themselves under the authority of the serpent. So this is how this verse, you know, really comes to life. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So since this story, this original garden story, the whole world has been under the power of the evil evil one, the very one they were supposed to subdue, instead subdued them. So from this point forward, all of mankind is under the power of the serpent. Also from this point forward, mankind is subjected to the power and the reign of death and including slavery to the fear of death. So we talked about this everybody's going to die. You know, you might have escaped death once or twice or even five times in your life, but at some point, death is going to win. Death rules. Death reigns over mankind. And you know what? All fear, if you've done your spiritual work and you've really, you know, analyzed what fear is all about, all fear can be traced back to the fear of death. That's a whole different teaching we don't have time to get into. But the fear of death is if, you know, no matter what happens, it is that going to lead to me becoming extinct? And people will do all sorts of things because they are afraid of death. People will do ridiculous things because they are afraid of death. Thankfully, hallelujah, because of Jesus, we have been redeemed from the reign of death. We have been redeemed from the fear of death. And we talked about that a little bit because we've entered into his death. We've been crucified with him. We're already dead. Woohoo! We're already dead, so we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. We're not all just already dead. We are already entered into eternal life with God because we believe that Jesus is Lord and God raised him. What? From the dead. Okay, so that's the, we've we've covered on that a little bit, but from this point, this is the point in the story of mankind where mankind becomes subject to death. God had told them, you eat what I tell you not to eat and you will die. But let's look at some other scriptures that make that clear. So from Hebrews chapter 2, we'll pick up halfway through verse uh, 14, that through death, this is talking about Jesus, Jesus through death might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So the devil has the power of death. He's the one subjugating all mankind to the power of death. He's He's on a mission to kill everybody. He's on a mission to destroy destroy everybody that he possibly can, or just get them to do things that will cause them to destroy themselves. Uh, So verse 15, and deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Okay, so 
The fear of death puts us in bondage. But when we don't fear death anymore, we are free. We are free from the power of death. Romans 5.14, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, death reigned. Reigned means death was king. Death had power. Death had authority. Death was the highest influence and control. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. So listen, you don't have to eat from the wrong tree in order to have death reign over you. Because Adam sinned, death reigns over you because you are a descendant of Adam. This was God's agreement with Adam, which was God's agreement with all of mankind. If you are a part of mankind, which if you're listening to this, you are, then you are subject to the reign of death, unless you have been redeemed from that through the blood of Jesus and faith in him. Paul also said it this way in Romans 5, verse 21, so that sin reigned in death, that grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when death reigns, sin is produced. People will sin because they're trying to avoid death, because they're afraid of death. Sin is reigning. Death is reigning. Sin is the controlling power. Death is the controlling power. But it's the gospel that gives us power against the power of sin and against the power of death. Are you starting to see how these things come together? So as a result of man's deception and disobedience, um, all of creation was placed under a curse. And this is what I was saying before. It's, you know, I want you to understand God did not curse mankind. God cursed creation because of what mankind did. Wow, is that not amazing? I mean, God, because of mankind's disobedience, God could have smited them right then and there. God could have destroyed them, made another man out of a different pile of dust, breathed life into them, started all over again. But he didn't. Instead, he did. He cursed the, the creation because of mankind's sin. And then because the creation was cursed, the it it produced results and consequences that created pain for mankind. So it's easy to, I know it sounds like splitting hairs and it sounds like semantics, but you know, it's important for you to understand the heart of God that God did not curse mankind, but he did things that it, it could feel cursed. Your existence can feel cursed because you can never get ahead. You've got all these thorns and thistles and the sweat of your brow that you're contending against all of the time. But it just wants you to see that, that God said in Genesis 3, verse 17, to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Did you see that? He didn't say, I curse you because of what you did. He says, cursed is the ground because of what you did. And now, because the ground is cursed, you know, I created this whole creation for you, and it was supposed to produce this multiplication for you. But now, because of your sin, the ground is cursed, and now you're going to have pain and, you know, all the days of your life and thorns and thistles it's going to bring forth. And, and also, you shall eat the plants of the field. Eating of the plants of the field, originally, Adam and Eve, you can do your homework on this, Adam and Eve were only supposed to eat seed-bearing fruit. They were not supposed to eat the plants of the field. The plants of the field was the fee- the food for the beasts. But now that creation is cursed, God knows that creation is not going to be creating or multiplying as much as it did when it was in a blessed existence. And so out of mercy, God expands or enlarges the food supply for man. So he opens up the window that mankind is now also allowed to eat the plants of the field. So this is a mercy of God that he's in enlarging the food supply. But at the same time, now, instead of eating the the fruit and the seed bearing fruit, which this changes in Noah. So if you want to, you know, make arguments about being a vegetarian or a fruitarian, you can knock yourself out. I still like a good steak every now and again. That's a different story altogether. But I, I want to be clear, Adam and Eve originally ate only fruit. 
And now there's God is saying to them, now you're going to also eat the plants of the food, the field. You're going to eat the beast's food. So that's like, you know, one night you're eating filet mignon and the next night you're eating dog food. OK, now it's still food, but you can see you got downgraded a bit. Now, you're thankful to have food in your belly, but it's a downgrade. So you see, that's all part of what's happening because of mankind's disobedience. Um, and in Romans 8, Paul talks about this, and these verses are fascinating. But the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Who subjected it? Well, Adam, through disobedience, caused God to subject the creation to futility. The, the creation was put under a curse because of man's disobedience and rebellion against God. So creation is longing to be redeemed and delivered. So, uh, but because of him who subjected it in hope, we're up to verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. So when it was put under a curse, it was put in bondage to corruption. It is waiting for its redemption. When the Son of God returns, when Jesus returns, all of creation has been groaning. That's what verse 22 says. We know that the whole creation has been groaning. It's been going, oh, save me. It's been in pain. It's been cursed ever since the days of Adam. Creation has been groaning together with the in the pains of childbirth until now. Okay, so one more thing that happens since the disobedience of man because of the serpent, the nature of the serpent. Now, what is the nature of the serpent? One who was designed to worship, but then wants worship for themselves. One who was designed to be a, an an honor, a representation of God, but then becomes instead the adversary of God through disobedience. That nature now is a spiritual power of rebellion against God that is at work in the world and in the hearts of all of mankind. So this comes out of Ephesians 2, point, uh, chapter 2, and verse 2, point B, uh, is following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Do you see it? So the 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 people of this world, they are walking in the pattern of this world. Who are they following? They're not following Jesus. Why do you think Jesus, when he would call his disciples, he would look them square in the eye and say, follow me? Why? Because they, what were they following? They were following the course of this world. They were following the prince of the power of the air. They were following maybe a person who pretended like, like they knew something about something or even knew something about God. They were following something else. They were following the evil one. They were following the one who was in rebellion against God. And that that is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We've used this term before. You're either a son of obedience because the Holy Spirit has come inside of you to lead you into righteous obedience in things that are pleasing to God, or you are not following the Holy Spirit, and by your conduct, you are proving yourself to be a son of disobedience, which means that you are a son of the evil one. So, in your study guide, there are some definitions there. The prince, because Paul says the prince of the power of the air. So the prince is the archon, the highest ruler, the power that is at work. That's exousia, the authority over it to do as it pleases. So we're the ones who are in this world who have not been redeemed, who are not following the Holy Spirit, are under the highest ruler of the power of the air, the evil one. They are under the authority of the uh, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience and air, the power of the air, that includes everything that's covered by air. So if you can find me something that's not covered by air, well, that is now not under the power of the evil one. OK, so we talked about this. You're a slave to what you obey. The other part of what happened with this is that mankind started to define their own definition of good and evil, as opposed to in Genesis 1 and 2. What we have is God creates something, God goes through the course of a day in creation, and then God says, this is good. 
And then God says later, this is very good. But mankind, when they take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they do so because they think it's going to make them what? Like God, that they get to determine what is good and what is evil rather than God saying what is good and what is evil. Do you see that? So they're in rebellion against God. They don't want to just take God's word for it of what God says is good. They want to determine for themselves what they say is good and what they say is evil. That's an element of what this is all about. So Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7, verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So, you know, we're, it's not until you disobey that you prove that sin is in you. So that's what Paul says. Did that which is good then bring death to me? So the command is good. God set everything up. Now, Paul in Romans 7 is actually talking about the law. I'm jumping on that to use that as a a cross-reference for it's not exactly the same as the law, but when God gave a command to Adam not to eat of the tree. But it's the same principle, the same uh, theory behind it, where Sin was in Adam, but he had never sinned until he disobeyed. And so through the commandment, the commandment was like, don't eat of the tree that you're not supposed to eat from. But then sin produced death. Sin caused Eve and Adam to eat what God had told them not to. So God had set things up in a good design, but they rebelled against that design. So sin is the enemy. The command was good, but the disobedience reveals that the enemy is in you. So this is where I'm putting the pieces together that the nature of the evil one is now in mankind. And the fact that that nature is in you is proved every time you do something that is not the command of God. Sin is not some external hypothetical thing. It is a spiritual power that is in work, that is at work in all of the descendants of Adam. And its purpose is to bring you to death, to lead you to death and destruction. Sin always is on a path of death and and destruction. And we've quoted this verse before, but 1 John 3, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. We were just talking about the story from the beginning. So anyone who's continuing in sin rather than placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so that the Holy Spirit comes into their lives so that they have power from within to resist sin and to walk in ways that are pleasing to God, in obedience to God, anyone who's still walking in sin demonstrates that the nature of the evil one is still in them and that they are still a son of disobedience, just like the serpent who exalted himself against God.